Please have a seat. Well, right here is fine. What I'll do is I'll um, make some introductions. I'll introduce you. If you have a seat right here, just you know, you talk from here. It'll be fine. Please. Okay. Some water. Yeah, maybe uh, just outside. Now, let me get some water from you as well. Should we bottles of water back there? Um, I'll be fine. It's okay. Sure. Let me just see if I get some water. Do we have time? We have a minute and a half. <laughs> You know, if I remember last time, you didn't need the water. Mm -hmm. we have bottles. Let me get, I'm going to get some bottles. Yeah, thank you. In fact, we need them for Tape is fine. Uh, one more piece. Perfect. Oh, that's it. That, that, that'll work. And okay. I think we're okay. Just some of these questions are way too long. She has like about four questions in here. But yeah, okay. All right, someone's trying to get us water. Okay. Here's scissors and tape. Yep. Do we so have the questions? We've got the questions. And we are in good shape oh, you here. Cut up that sheet already? Where are they? Where was that big sheet of questions? She cut up some of them. I'm right here. I'm um, well. How are you? Do oh, you have them all down here? We're so you fine. Can you hand them to you at all? Looks like I'm a solo. Hand them to you? I got called away. So Tell me what is easy for you. Yeah, if you hand to me, then I'll put them in the. See, this is the current stuff. This is stuff for, for the second half. Right, you want me to hold on to them? Post here. Yeah, for the second half, you hold on to them. Thank you. Thank you. These are the bios for the second half. That's correct. Sam? Sam? For the introductory comments, I'm going to ask people to stand and be recognized, starting with you as President Andy Kleiman. You're down there. Well, uh, Donna's going to be answering questions. Uh, I'd love to. Would you like to? OK. 
Yeah, because the uh, stairs are over on that side. If you wish, I'm, I'll squeeze in the schedule, no problem. Folks, we're going to start in 30 seconds. Please take your seats. I do. Thank you. Mo got it. Thank you very much. Do we need water? Folks, please take your seats. We do have a webinar to produce. Okay, we'll start in 10 seconds. Terrific. Uh, folks, welcome to the Town Hall Forum on Healthcare Policy. This is Monday, March 10, 2014. This Town Hall Forum is being sponsored by the Medical Society of the State of New York. We're here in Albany Hilton in downtown Albany. And it's about 5.30, maybe 5.34 p.m. And I have several welcome introductions to make. And I also want to say we have an exciting program this evening. We have individuals who are from the executive branch and also from the legislative branch joining us this evening. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, briefly our uh, officers, uh, Sam Untricht, our president, our current president of Medical Society State of New York. Sam Untricht. <laughs> Andy Kleiman, our president-elect, is also here. Andy. <laughs> Paul Papia, chair of the Legislation Physician Advocacy Committee. He is also here tonight. Thank you, Paul. Charles Rothberg, Commissioner, Commission on Governmental Relations for Miss Nee. Charles. And Elizabeth Dears Esquire, Senior Vice President, Chief Legislative Counsel for Miss Nee. And she's in the back waving back there too. Elizabeth, thank you. Tonight we have an interactive dialogue with our guests. Uh, tonight we have Donna Frescator, who is the Executive Director of the New York Health Benefit Exchange. Donna is uh, the state's official health plan marketplace director. This was created under the Affordable Care Act. And prior to being executive director of New York State of Health, Donna was the assistant deputy secretary of health in Governor Cuomo's office. She also served as the state's Medicaid director and deputy commissioner of the Office of Health Insurance Programs at the New York State Department of Health. At this point, I'd like to introduce Donna Frescator for a few moments, uh, for a few comments, and then we have several questions that we'd like to ask from the audience and also from our web-based audience as well. Donna. Great, thank you. You know, you know what, I'm either gonna move down, I can't see half the room, I'm too short. Sure. Sit half the room. So I'm actually either gonna stand if I can, microphone, or I'm gonna move down here so I can see everyone. Thank you. Thank you, um, good evening everyone. I think I may be a soloist here. I think Troy Oshner, uh, my colleague from the Department of Financial Services, was, was called away, and hopefully he'll be able to join us. Um, so it's hard to believe a year's gone by um, since we were last here talking about our state marketplace. And so, so everyone knows, um, you know, over time, we've kind of changed the terminology up a bit here. We were, we were referring uh, to this thing that we were working on as an exchange. We focus grouped um, some names, with consumers throughout New York State, both in New York City and way over in the western part of the state, as well as some very rural areas of the state. And marketplace resonated better. People understood, that's pretty consistent with what we heard nationally, that marketplace basically, um, people understood it was someplace you went and you shopped and you compared options and exchange didn't really mean that much. So I'll probably use them interchangeably. Um, so uh, forgive me for that, our brand name is New York State of Health, also, uh, the result of some focus group activity that we did on naming the exchange and uh, we announced that last August. So we think of our exchange or our marketplace as an organizer. Um, I think of it as a purchaser of healthcare for individuals throughout <coughs> New York State. Um, it has two components, a uh, marketplace for individuals and families to buy their coverage directly and a marketplace for small businesses. Uh, we define small business in New York as 50 or fewer employees. Um, and what we're really seeing is that the businesses that are signing up are actually very small uh, and tend to have around an average of five employees, which is um, consistent with some of our projections. 
Earlier today, uh, the Department of Health announced um, some new enrollment numbers. We are tracking two primary metrics for um, our success here. The first is the number of completed applications. Individuals can apply online uh, through the website and a good proportion of people, in fact, have taken that avenue to apply. They can also apply by telephone and they can apply um, with the help of one of 8,000 in-person assisters located throughout New York. So as of midnight uh, yesterday, um, about 908,000 people had submitted and completed their application. That is, they had gotten an, an almost instantaneous decision on their eligibility and whether they qualify for our state Medicaid program, whether their children qualify for our CHIP program in New York, and whether they qualify um, as adults or children for uh, coverage through the marketplace, either with or without financial assistance. 590,600 or so people, nearly 600,000 people have signed up for coverage since uh, we opened on October 1st of 2013. In recent days, um, thousands of people uh, sign up every day and we expect that will continue to escalate as we reach or get closer to the March 31st open enrollment deadline for coverage under the federal law. So as you know, we opened on October 1st to a far higher volume of web activity than I think we could have reasonably expected. Two million web hits in the first two hours we were open. Um, within a few days, uh, we were able to work with our systems integrator and quadruple the capacity of the system. And I'm pleased to say that since that Saturday, that was about four days after opening, the system has been performing um, up to our expectations. 95% of the time when you hit submit, you hit next, um, you want that system taking action. 95% of the time you have a response within five seconds. Uh, so we're very pleased with performance. Our customer service representatives have answered about 760,000 calls. Uh, on a busy day, they answer between 1,500 and 1,700 calls an hour. There are over 750 people on the phones um, to answer questions. And as I mentioned, about 8,000 assisters um, in person, combination of licensed insurance brokers who have completed continuing education courses designed for our marketplace, um, navigators who are largely community-based organizations, 48 different organizations, bring with them 96 sub organizations or subcontractors, and collectively they help individuals in over 40 different languages. And then certainly, last but not least, certified application counselors, thousands of them throughout the state, often employed by health plans, by hospitals, by healthcare providers, offices who are available to take applications um, as well. So some of the early demographics that we're seeing on who's enrolling, and we released a report in December uh, I'm sorry, in January, on December activity, we'll do that again when open enrollment closes in March. Um, we are seeing that about 74% of the people who are signing up for coverage report they were uninsured at the time they applied. Now that's slightly higher for people who qualify for our state Medicaid program and for Child Health Plus, a little bit lower than 74% for people who are purchasing private coverage. We also see that of those who qualify for private coverage, about 70% are eligible to receive financial assistance to help them pay their monthly premium. And that financial assistance comes in one of two forms under the federal law. Um, federal tax credits help you pay your monthly premium so you can choose to use your premiums month by month to reduce your monthly payment to your insurer. And cost sharing credits, which you know, in my view are very important and sometimes I think somewhat overlooked in the tax credit conversation because what they do is they reduce your out-of-pocket costs when you get medical services. So for example, if you have income at or below 250% of federal poverty level, perhaps instead of paying a $30 copay for a service, you may only be required to pay $10. And what we're seeing is that a vast number of people who are purchasing through the marketplace, in fact, are qualifying for those cost sharing credits. So we're pleased uh, to see that as well. So, you know, as we go here, we learn every day. Um, we have 16 health plans that are offering health insurance, medical coverage on the marketplace, another nine or 10 standalone dental insurers, which is one of the provisions of the federal law. And we see people every day qualifying for Medicaid, qualifying for Child Health Plus, or for subsidized coverage. Um, as I mentioned, many of them 
um, almost 70% of those who are qualifying for private coverage come to us right on the website. Um, yet we know the website's not really the answer for um, every consumer. And so we want to make certain that as we reach March 31st, we have sufficient in-person assister capacity and phone capacity to handle those enrollments. Um, you know, we were also focused on October 1st as really the end date to open our marketplace. And in fact, it was really the beginning um, of a new uh, program of new processes, of new rules, new federal rules, new, sis new IT systems, um, as well as a number of other things. And so, you know, I think that we certainly, we learn every day and we hear from consumers and healthcare providers every day. Just about every day we still have meetings of our IT um, experts and consultants, our customer service representatives and managers, and our own internal staff, both on our marketplace staff and our um, Medicaid staff. And sometimes we even invite our DFS colleagues into those discussions. Because this is something that we need, we need to hear consumers, we need to hear healthcare providers, and we need to make modifications as we go forward. Um, and part of those, that discussion is really taking place right now as we begin to plan for the plan offerings in calendar year 2015. So under the federal requirements, uh, we will recertify health plans, not only the insurer, but the actual plans, I call them products, that the insurers offer on our marketplace. And so we've just started that discussion um, to, to identify what those requirements will be for individuals in 2015 and for small businesses as well as we move forward. We're geared up for March 31st for most individuals in families. That is the date by which you must purchase coverage in order uh, to have coverage in calendar year 2014. If you miss that date, um, there are special enrollment periods, but you must have um, a certain life events, like lose your coverage through your employment, have a child, get married, get divorced. So it's not automatic that someone that comes in and applies for coverage in July can necessarily enroll. They may have to wait until the next open enrollment period, which begins in November 15th. So our messaging around that has really been stepped up and pretty soon you'll see in our media campaign a real focus on March 31st. The second phase of our media has also really focused on younger adults, um, about 31% of the people who have purchased private coverage thus far are under the age of 30. Um, that's probably a little, a little bit higher percentage than uh, throughout the nation, but certainly a very important group uh, to message, and we're using a combination of digital advertising, social media um, advertising, and outreach uh, for that population. So as far as what's next, um, I think we're, we'll be entering into a period of time where we will be inviting health plans to apply for participation in 2015. Um, that'll kick off with a plan invitation, um, which we had originally thought would be issued um, this week. We need a little bit more time to sort of review and digest some of the comments we received from our regional advisory committee meetings and from the public um, before we finalize that document. And of course, uh, that will enter really the rate setting and form um, approval process with our colleagues at DFS um, in preparation for November 15th. So with that, I, if it's okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop and give folks an opportunity to um, ask some questions. Donna has been very gracious to entertain questions, but what I'm going to do is also introduce Troy Oshner, ask him to give a few comments, and we'll have a panel discussion with them both with the questions that you're uh, 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 providing. If you're just joining the webinar, uh, once again, you're joining the healthcare forum that Ms. Nee is providing in the 2014. I am Jerry Cohn, the Speaker of the House of Delegates, and I'm uh, co-moderating this forum with Akira Jirasi Chardulo, uh, my vice speaker. And if you are on the web, uh, we ask you to send questions to lobbyquestions at lobby.org. That again is lobbyquestions, all one word, lobbyquestions at lobby.org. If you send the questions in, we'll get the questions in and we'll be able to answer uh, the questions accordingly. Also, as far as participants here in the room, uh, we ask you, ask you to fill in these uh, um, uh, green sheets, pass them to the staff in the room, and we'll try and get to your questions as well. We seem to have a lot of questions, so I will not take up much time talking. Instead, I want to introduce uh, Troy Oshner, who is our Deputy Superintendent for Health, Department of Financial Services, and a few words about Troy, and 
Uh, I would like to say that Troy is, has responsibilities including licensing, examination, regulation of all health insurers and related entities. Before joining the department, Mr. Osher spent almost 14 years with the Office of, the, of Attorney General New York, and since August 2000, he served in the Health Care Bureau, where he was Deputy Bureau Chief. Mr. Oshner directed litigation against health plans, drug manufacturers, pharmacy benefit managers for legal and deceptive business practices. He has also had responsibility for various consumer initiatives, including a consumer helpline that advocated for consumers and providers in health care disputes with insurers. Very important person for us, Troy Oshner. I'd like to ask you to, to give about uh, three to five minutes worth of comments, but no more because with lots of questions. Troy. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I want to say a special thanks to, to Liz Deers and, and Mo Oster and to, to Dr. Kleinman uh, for, for having me here. And it's just, it's a pleasure to be here. We have a long history of, of a very close, good working relationship with the Medical Society. You guys are, are of course, crucial and, and a key player in, in a lot of what we do uh, at the department and, and uh, throughout the system. So I, I have three minutes, um, which isn't much. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments focused to one big bill that many of you may have heard about. And it has to do with out-of-network surprise bills. It's the single biggest source of consumer health care complaints that we get, has been for many, many years. And the basic scenario is, I'm the consumer. I do everything I can to stay in network. I uh, get all my approvals, I go to my in-network do primary care doctor, to my in-network specialist, uh, go to an in-network hospital, get approval from my plan, and I get a surprise bill three weeks later from an anesthesiologist, radiologist, pathologist, or some other specialist who came in and nobody told me, and they're out of network, and my coverage either doesn't exist, because I don't have out-of-network coverage, or it's really bad and so I'm faced with a big bill. And so we have a bill in the governor's office that, that we have uh, worked with you on. I know that, that there's uh, still some pieces that, that you're, you're trying to work on. But the basic idea of the bill is that it takes the consumer out of it, the patient out of it, which is absolutely something I know, uh, you know doctors are, are concerned about. Uh, the patient is taken out of it. Uh, in those emergency and surprise billing situations where the patient doesn't have a choice. Mind you, the vast majority of instances where consumers are using their out-of-network benefits and are making a conscious decision are completely unaffected by this bill, but it's just those situations where there is that surprise. And the basic idea of the bill is that in the insurer is going to have responsibility for making the consumer uh, fully protected and not liable for the bill. So the, pri the responsibility is on the insurer. And so in any emergency situation, the doctor can, as now, can continue to bill the patient. And it's like with an HMO, it's the insurer's responsibility to make the consumer uh, not liable for that bill. And in a surprise billing situation, there's an assignment of benefits. If the consumer assigns their benefits over to the doctor, then the doctor doesn't bill the consumer but goes after the, um, the health plan for, you know, and, and works it out with the health plan. There's a dispute resolution process if they can't agree. Uh, the doctor and the insurer. And in the dispute resolution process, the standard is, um, I think, very deferential to the physician. It's whether the, the doctor's bill will prevail unless there is a gross disparity between what that doctor is charging and what other out-of-network doctors are charging, considering the particular characteristics of the patient, the doctor's experience, and the um, UCR, usual customary rate, defined as the 80th percentile of fair health. Uh, in addition, it's loser pays, so that will hopefully dissuade uh, uh, insurers from uh, abusing the system. And on top of that, it could be an unfair claim settlement practice if an insurer repeatedly refuses to settle a, a reasonably due claim. So that's one piece of the bill. It also adds some important network adequacy protections. It gives the Department of Financial Services, uh, for the first time, we will be doing 
the network adequacy reviews in the initial instance, and that will put pressure on insurers to make sure that their networks are adequate from the get-go. And it also has a safety valve provision so that even though we've stamped a, a network as, as a, you know, adequate, if for some reason, either because doctors leave or a, a major hospital or somebody leaves the network in the middle of the year, or because there's some special, very particular specialty that we didn't catch, that safety valve provision gives the consumer the right to go out of network at the in-network cost sharing if there's not an appropriate provider uh, in network. So and that's a very important review in the uh, piece. And the last thing I'll just mention is that uh, there's a number of uh, important disclosure requirements. And in you know, one, what we've seen in many markets is that uh, they're either, um, it's very difficult. Insurers are offering coverage for out of network, but it's very difficult to buy a really decent uh, 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 value benefit. So this bill would require insurers, when they offer coverage for out of network, they have to make available at least one decent benefit design, uh, and it's defined as the 80th percentile of fair health, UCR, 80th percentile of fair health, and they have to cover at least a 70% cost share of that. So that that is uh, in the governor's bill, and um, I think I've probably exhausted my three minutes. So I just wanted to say thank you very much, and I, I really look forward to your questions. Thank you. Now, as Troy Oshner, we'll have opportunity to ask questions. Um, by the way, they gave me the wrong email address for those of those, those folks around the web. The email address that you should send the questions to should be lobbyquestions at misne.org. Lobbyquestions, all one word, lobbyquestions at misne.org. A medical science state of New York, MSSNY.org. Uh, not the other one, which uh, please scratch that. Okay, getting to the questions. Um, we seem to have had like four or five questions regarding the 90-day rules. So for Donna Frescatore, I'd like to ask the question this way. If a patient signs up for insurance but stops paying the premiums, there appear to be problems about how physician practices will be notified and about how to get paid for services, especially between 31 and 90 days after non-payment of the premiums. What is New York State doing to protect vulnerable physicians? Thank you, Dr. Kovic. So I'm going to share this question with, with Troy because it's a collaboration that we, we've had um, on this issue. So, so there's some places where we need to follow the federal law and rule on the marketplace. And this is one of those areas where um, the federal rule gives certain individuals who purchase through the marketplace more time to pay their premium. Probably yeah. Donna, can you please talk into the microphone? Sure. Sorry. Is that on? Probably more, probably more. So Can you hear in the back of the room? So, so? Uh, is this better? Someone better? Yeah. Uh, I see a green light on the other one, so let's use yeah, that, that one between the two of you. I'm sorry, okay. this one's not Terrific. working. Okay, terrific, thanks, Troy. Okay, can so, you hear people, uh, can you hear down in the back of the room now? Good. Perfect. Two thumbs up, one thumb up from Liz, so we'll take it. So um, this is, you know, certainly one place in the federal rule that um, has a fairly expansive period of time for certain individuals who buy through the marketplace um, to pay the premium. And what the federal rule requires us to allow is for the very first premium payment, the initial premium payment that an individual makes to their health insurer after they sign up on the individual marketplace, um, that period can be relatively short. But if the individual receives advanced premium tax credits, um, and most have so far, about 70% of people who are purchasing as individuals, at least thus far, um, have qualified for those credits, the federal rule allows them 90 days to pay for their premium. Um, further, it says that during the first 30 days, the health insurer must provide coverage and pay for medical services. For the remaining 60 days, it uh, leaves that a little bit, it leaves it up, up in the air about whether or not the individual is going to ultimately pay for the premium or not, and permits insurers to pend claims during that 60-day period until they know whether or not that individual is going to pay for the premium. So it is a longer period of time than we've had historically had in New York um, as far as grace periods. It is not something um, that we are able to unilaterally change as, as the state. It is part of the federal law and rule in this program. And I know that Troy and uh, his office have been working with, with the marketplace staff to try to come up with systems. And you know, I think this is kind of a theme throughout. You know, how do we build smart systems and how do we use technology in a smart way so that 
doctors and other healthcare providers can understand where a patient is and their benefits, whether it's this 90-day grace period, whether it's whether, uh, the, whether or not their patient has met their upfront deductible, whether or not they're eligible. And you know, I think that um, we, we need to all work on technology as a way to sort of address those informational needs that, that you all have uh, in, in conducting, you know, in treating your patients and in, in running your, your practices. So Troy, I don't know if you want to add some of the details about you know, some, some of what's been discussed. Um, sure. So, you know, as Donna said, uh, we didn't make the role. We're trying to live with it and trying to make it uh, as uh, painless for, for consumers, of course, as, as well as providers. Um, currently, the way the world is, of course, if an insurer doesn't pay their first month, uh, then potentially, you know, the, the, there's no coverage and the, uh, you know, we do get complaints regularly from providers who, you know, thought that there was coverage during that first month, the consumer ultimately didn't end up paying, and they're, they're on the hook for that month. Uh, what you've got now is a three-month period. The first month is paid by the insurer under the federal rules, but you have now a two-month exposure where, so instead of being essentially one-month exposure under the way it currently works, you got two months. You got an extra full month of potential exposure, and it's a big deal, particularly for hospitals and others who may be providing some, you know, and, and any of you, providing some really expensive services um, and not knowing whether you're, you're gonna get paid for that. Uh, what we've tried to do is set up a system of notices that uh, the insurer must give to the uh, provider um, during that period if there is uh, claim activity, service activity going on. Uh, but certainly one of the things we're trying to work on, as Donna said, in, in terms of technology, is really uh, developing the capability so that there can be much better electronic interface and instantaneous ability of, of uh, providers to you know, check the most current status. Uh, having said that, the rule is still the rule, so um, the person, the consumer, still is potentially going to have coverage if they pay within that that 90-day period and uh, won't if they don't. Okay, to follow up, does this mean if the physician provides service between days, say, 30 and 90 or 31 and 90, if the, he ultimately or she ultimately finds that the insurance company has denied payment because, of deni because the premium has not been paid, does the physician still have the right to go and bill the patient? Oh, absolutely, yes. The, the, then I sh that's, thank you for clarifying that. When I say the, phys the provider's potentially on the hook, I mean that you now are in a situation where you're, instead of going after the insurer, where you have a much more assured source of payment, uh, you have to go after the consumer, the patient, and uh, but you absolutely still have the, you know, because that person did not have insurance coverage then, so they're like anybody else without coverage, and you can bill them. Yes. There's also one more twist to ask. Uh, is it possible or legal for the physician to actually pay the premium on behalf of the patient so that there's still coverage through the 90 days? The reasoning being that the premium may actually be less than the amount of money that's owed. For example, for a very large procedure that's done. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting question. I don't know if Donna wants to weigh in. It's something that the hospitals, others have asked us and uh, I don't know that we have a definitive answer, but go ahead. No, I, I, yeah. would, ag I would agree, Troy. It's a question that uh, you could imagine we were asked pretty early on in this process. And there is um, some federal guidance that um, suggests that's, that's not allowable. Um, we continue, we think we need more information from our federal partners on that, uh, but that's certainly some, some guidance, in the, not in the form of a rule, but some, as I understand it, but some guidance out of HHS that suggests that's not permissible. But it's something we're still looking at. Yeah. Okay, the next question I have is, what can be done to create a search function so physicians and patients are able to easily determine which plans a given physician is participating in? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll take this one, Troy. So um, as, as you may know, um, health plans are required to submit provider network data to the Department of Health, uh, formerly for commercial insurance in the marketplace. It's commercial insurance in New York. It was once a year. That was a requirement on health maintenance organizations. And that was really the data that was used by the Department of Health to examine the networks. And Troy talked a little bit earlier about how the governor's bill expands that kind of review uh, to other types of insurers um, in New York. And what we, we initially built our information technology system for the marketplace so that we would be able to display provider and doctor in particular participation at the time the individual was shopping for insurance. And in all honesty, the very first thing we encountered um, is that there was great variability in the data. Addresses were a little different. Um, phone numbers sometimes differed um, as we received the data. And so based on some other states' experience uh, that made that information available right from the very start, we kind of took a step back and uh, we worked with some people who are sort of in the industry of validating address and phone number data <coughs> to make certain that we could, we could cleanse that data as best we could. Um, and so starting um, shortly after the marketplace went live on October 1st, we added a doctor lookup function um, to the website. And so if you're in the process of applying for insurance, you can, there are several filters when you go to select your health plan. So you can filter, for example, on doctor participation. You can filter on quality rating of the health plan. You can filter certainly on premium cost after your any applicable tax credits. And we believe that functionality is, is working. Um, it, the caveat is that you know, we, want to, we have to make sure that data is timely and as accurate as possible because that's what the consumer is actually seeing at the time they select their health plan. And so one of the things that we all have done is we've increased the requirement for health plans to report provider networks to us from quarterly to monthly. Um, and at any time um, when there's a significant change. And we're still working a little bit to define what's a significant change in that data. Um, but certainly when that information has not really been at the consumer's fingertips in the past when they've applied. It might have been on another website. It might have been in another, you know, on a paper directory, but not necessarily interactive in the plan selection process. As soon as we're comfortable we have that data and that system running timely and effectively, we're going to take it and just put it on the website in a way where you can query without applying. We think ultimately that makes sense for consumers to be able to get on and use that data. You all see that data without actually going through the application process or giving any personal information in order to do that. That segues into the next question having to do with the accuracy of these lists. We've heard many comments that the exchange networks appear to be listing physicians that have not agreed to participate in these plans. Uh, what is being done to assure that the health panel lists are accurate? Troy. Oh, I'm going to defer to He's Donna gonna on that. <laughs> Troy's going to punt. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. So the federal law requires that marketplaces um, make certain that the networks of all health plans that are offered uh, to consumers are adequate. Federal rules don't define what adequate means. Um, but certainly place with the states the responsibility for doing that if they operate their marketplace. Um, in New York, we had a bit of a head start on this, um, although we might all agree an imperfect, uh, that there might not be any perfect set of adequacy standards. But the head start we had was the work that had been done and the standards that had been used by the Department of Health for many, many years to certify HMOs in New York, health maintenance organizations. And, and the requirements that were being placed um, on the Medicaid managed care health plans as well as the Child Health Plus plans. So for the marketplace purpose, we adopted those standards um, with a little bit of modification and I think that that's part of the discussion now for 2015 as well is how do you modify those standards. Um, we have certainly uh, gotten some reports that data in the directories was not timely or accurate. Uh, we certainly your colleagues at MISNI have presented us um, with some of that information. We take that pretty seriously. For those of you who might have worked with the Department of Health before on these issues, you'll know that we, we feel very strongly these, that consumers rely on this information. Um, what we find when we look into the individual situations um, is that sometimes, um, in fact, the directory might be inaccurate. Other times, there just might be a misunderstanding 
um, about participation. I mean, these contracts between health plans and uh, health care providers, in particular doctors, really take all shapes and forms. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that every health plan um, contracted just for the marketplace. In some cases, you know, pre-existing contracts um, included um, include the marketplace as go forward. We're looking now at a variety of different um, ways we can go about doing an independent validation of, of the directories, um, and I expect we'll be able to st start that pretty shortly, and that's information that we'll have. We encourage you in the interim um, all, all and all your colleagues, that if you think the information's incorrect, the more specific you can be um, with us, uh, the quicker we can correct it if it needs correction, and the more actionable it is from the regulator standpoint. So sp specifics help us enormously. Um, okay, well to follow up, supposing a physician, perhaps we should put a call out to the membership to go check the website to see what is listed for an individual practice, individual physician. If physician checks his own listing and finds that's inaccurate or incorrect or whatever, uh, who does he or she contact within your office? Yeah, so um, first of all, I would say that, you know, if you, if you check the listing and you believe you're, you're listed as inaccurate, you know, you want to make certain that, um, that you, you know, you can contact the health plan as well, see what is the basis for being listed. But by all means, um, you all can write to me. You can call my office. Uh, you can call Randy Embriaco, who's the director of plan management. Uh, some of you um, uh, may, may know that name. I know certainly our MISNI colleagues know Randy, and we'll have our folks look into it. I mean, we'll look at it with, with a health plan. Um, I think that, you know, we have um, a handful of situations thus far. We've been, able to va we've been able to determine there's some inaccuracy. When we find that and we, can, we, can, we know that the consumer based a, a decision about enrolling in a health plan based on inaccurate information, we require the health plan to, to cover that service, to make that referral. And this electronic submission process we have now allows us to go back and do that. It allows us to say yes on such and such a day when this individual applied for coverage, they did in fact see that this doctor particip was showing as participating in this health plan. That's new functionality that the provider lookup tool gives us. Okay, Troy, would you like to comment? No, I'm, uh, good. I, I, I'm good. You know, good. I mean, I, I think good. that 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 there's there's two issues, as Donna said. Number one is making sure that the standards that we use are the best that they reasonably can be, and it's something we we uh, look to MISNI to to you know help us think through. But but even more importantly, really enforcing that. And as Donna said, you know, we've already received um, some really good information from uh, the medical society, and. I uh, look forward to, to more to, to helping uh, to police that. Yep. On a follow-up note, of course, some of us are very skeptical of the insurance companies uh, listing physicians purposely when the physicians are not part of the plan. Um, what penalties are there for the insurance companies lying about the physician panels that they supposedly uh, are, are telling the public they have? Uh, well, we could potentially hit them with a... Um, Deceptive business practice. There's a thousand dollar per violation fine, which, depending on how you slice that, can add up really big uh, from the Department of Financial Services. But also, you know, the the New York State of Health. Yeah, I mean, there's and certainly in the public health law as well for the HMOs, there's um, there's a series of, of fines for violation of of the pub, of public health law that can be imposed. You know, one of the very first steps that we always take when we're, when it's reported to us that there's an inaccuracy in the directory is we go to the health plan and say, demonstrate to us, show us why you listed this healthcare provider. What is the basis for listing this? And you know, there there's enforcement actions that happen not only at the DFS side, but also on the Department of Health side. You know, ultimately, there, there is a contract um, between the marketplace and between the participating health plans, and, you know, um, there is certainly um, in really egregious situations or where um, we, 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 we find that the directories are in, intentionally inaccurate in the event that were to be found. I mean, we have, we have contract recourse as, as well. Um, well. Again, though, what we do as we see this reported on a case-by-case basis is we investigate it, we ask the health plan to document um, why they think there's a contract, and um, if the consumer was displayed that information and there's reasonable, uh, there's reason, there's, it's reasonable to think they relied on it, we're going to ask, we're going to instruct the health plan they have to cover those services. 
Okay. Uh, another question to ask. I'm getting a lot of questions now regarding surprise medical bills, and Troy, you had addressed this early in your remarks. And so uh, to get to one of these questions, the question is this. To have to arbitrate every emergency claim by an out-of-network physician is, um, is foolish. How many doctors do you think will risk losing an arbitration than have to pay? And the comment being that many would choose not to provide care under these circumstances. So with the, uh, the game plan being by the insurance company to lowball the physicians, and a lot of physicians just giving up and saying, I don't want to play under those circumstances, uh, what's, your, what's, your, uh, what's your comment to that? Well, uh, my comment is uh, I think that the situation will, should, and, and I believe will improve for physicians at a network, and here's why. Right now, the way the world is, is if you're, in, let's take emergency, and we're, we're very sensitive to not having unintended, or to avoiding unintended consequences. So uh, we, we, the ability of physicians to remain out of network is crucial, and the ability uh, for uh, hospitals and others to be able to staff uh, their, their needed services by physicians is absolutely crucial. So. The way it works, let's take the emergency situation. <clears throat> right now, if you're an emergency physician and you're not participating, obviously if you're participating, none of this applies. But So if you're non-participating non right now, your choice is to bill the consumer. And you have to pay money, obviously, for a collection agent to run down the consumer. And at least from what I hear, uh, most doctors don't get all of every bill when they do that. So. Now, um, what you have is the HMO rule applied to everybody, which is you can continue to bill the consumer, and the insurer needs to do whatever they need to do to make the consumer not get balance billed. So they can continue to, to uh, bill the consumer. The insurer has the ability um, right now because they're liable. The, the only difference between HMOs the way it is now is there, and it's not an arbitration, it's an independent dispute resolution. They can affirmatively bring and challenge a claim uh, if they want, but their burden is very heavy. <laughs> they have to show that the doctor's bill was in gross disparity between with what other out-of-network doctors uh, bill. They have to show essentially that it's excessive, that there is a really an excessive bill on the part of the doctor. And again, the standard is very deferential, takes into account the doctor's ex training and experience, the particular characteristics of the patient, and UCR defined as the 80th percentile of fair health for, I think everybody knows what that is. So, um, so a, a, an insurer needs to believe that they're going to win uh, otherwise, they won't, and they're going to incur a, you know, they're going to, it's loser pay, so they'll have to incur the cost of the, of the independent dispute resolution. And if they do it repeatedly, they would be in violation of an unfair claim settlement practice. So, in other words, if they were doing a practice, engaged in a practice of just challenging claims that they didn't have any legitimate basis for, for doing. That's an unfair claim settlement practice and it's an additional thousand dollar fine per, per claim that they would uh, uh, do. So it's, you know, I think for all those reasons, um, it, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's going to uh, drive doctors out of business. Um, and that's, you know, that, that would be my argument. Okay, to follow up, um, my understanding, our understanding is that the reason for this legislative initiative is because of the surprise bill, somebody going to the emergency room getting a bill for a million dollars. That something egregious like that is the reason why we're seeing this legislation come yep. down the pike. Yep. Um, do we really need this legislation for something as egregious as that? It seems to me that if somebody presents a bill for a million dollars, it's so outrageous that the, there's mechanisms already to, to deal with that. Why have these additional mechanisms? Well, I mean, the mechanisms for the consumer is to bring a lawsuit against the doctor, it's not a very realistic or ef effective tool for, you know, most consumers. And we get a lot of complaints, as I said, like it's the number one source of complaints. What we want is just surprise bills. And you're right, the idea is to go after 
uh, just the excessive bills, which is why we've made the standard so, if you will, deferential, so that it's only where there's a gross disparity between what the doctor's charging and what other out-of-network doctors are charging that the um, doctor won't prevail. Okay, and one more follow-up question on that. You mentioned that there is a $1,000 penalty for the insurance company if they're lowballing the physicians and they're repeatedly going through this process of lowballing, lowballing. E each, each time they did it would be a separate violation. Right, but I don't suppose this would happen with the very first uh, instance. Uh, how many instances would have to occur before this, uh, this penalty provision would kick in? Uh, we haven't set like a, a, a definite number, but it would be repeated. So it would have to be you know, more than one, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question on the same line is, could allowing collective bargaining decrease the need for out-of-network legislation? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's more of a question uh, for our next panel. Yeah, that, maybe that's okay. a question for you. I'm sorry, that's not really fair. Okay. Um, another question that we have here is that health insurance companies need to do a better job with transparency with a member identification card. They are not printing the dollar amount of the deductible on the face of the card. Uh, is there some way to enforce a change so that that would be right on the card itself? And that question really is for Donna. Yeah, so, you know, over the years, I can tell you, we've, we've gone through, I think, every iteration of an ID card, from cards that said absolutely nothing, because they were, I guess, smart, or not smart, but there were electronic systems that stood behind them, to cards that had a whole lot of information. So, you know, I, I guess the way I would sort of pose that question back, um, and it kind of goes to a comment I made earlier, I made earlier, is that, you know, in this, in this in era of technology, is there a way to get information to doctors' offices and healthcare providers in a better, more timely, more reliable way? So, for example, if someone purchased on the individual marketplace and they picked one of the silver-tiered plans and they had a $250 deductible, is it helpful that that $250 is printed, embossed on, the, on their ID card, or is what we're really seeking more of a way for you all to know whether or not that deductible has been satisfied or not, right? And sort of where people are in terms of their coverage, um, whether it's their deductible, whether a service is covered. And so I think that um, certainly, you know, we can have discussion about what's on the face of the card itself. Um, but that ultimately what we need, and you know, maybe we're just coming off building an IT system here uh, that's, uh, do, that's determining eligibility um, in a kind of complicated, through with complicated algorithms for tens of thousands of people a day. But it, it seems as though there, we, that we, we all need to, I think, group around what kinds of information is most helpful and what's the most efficient way to do that. You know, what is, is, it, is information on a card really in today's, you know, kind of with today's technology, the answers or something that's better. I don't know, I would certainly invite Troy, I know he, he's had many of these discussions over the years as well. Yeah, I, I think that uh, some insurers are, are really good about the information that they put on the face of the card in terms of, you know, the specific co-payment and uh, if there's a co-insurance and what the deductible is. And I think that that's uh, useful and a good point and I, you know, be happy to work with MISNI on, on mm -hmm. seeing how we can make sure better information is on cards. Uh, but I agree with Donna that often when I hear the complaints, it's, it's not, it's, I mean, sometimes it's because the, the card isn't good. And very often when I've seen cards that, that aren't uh, very informative, they're often from self-funded plans, which we don't have any jurisdiction over anyway, like union benefit and other plans. But uh, that being said, I think the, the key is what I think what most providers want to know is where are they in the deductible? <laughs> that, that's a really crucial piece of information. And, and we don't have a good, uh, good way of tracking that right now. And that's, I think, something that, that would be a good project for us to, to work on. So that sounds like that's on the radar for improvement yeah. in the system next year or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another question. I think this is best for Troy. And again, gets to the jurisdictional questions. Many individuals live in New Jersey and Connecticut, yet work in New York City. Most of their doctors are in New York City, and they see them before or after work or during lunch breaks. 
these new individual plans are making it impossible for these patients to see doctors in network because the plan they're enrolled in at home in New Jersey or Connecticut does not have jurisdiction in New York City and these plans don't have out-of-network benefits. Many of these visits are for chronic maintenance, not emergency care, so therefore insurance exceptions would not apply. And the question for Troy is, uh, is this on your radar of problems and how would you suggest fixing this? I mean, yes, we get uh, consumer complaints from people in, uh, in New Jersey and Connecticut, it's very common, also Pennsylvania uh, and other neighboring states. Um, and under the insurance law, the issue is where was the insurance, the commercial insurance delivered? And there's a test for delivery, but it's basically, you know, if, if, it's, if it's delivered in Connecticut, then it's a Connecticut plan and Connecticut rules apply. And if that Connecticut plan doesn't have providers in New York City, uh, there's not a ton that the New York State Department of Financial <laughs> Services can do about it other than you know work with the Connecticut Department of Insurance uh, on that. Uh, so you know recognize the problem. Uh, certainly, you know interstate cooperation and trying to get get providers to uh, and get employers really to demand that uh, insurers if they're going to sign people up you know f for a particular set of insurance that they have the ability to. Uh, either get an out-of-network benefit so they can go see their doctor in the city where they maybe they work, or that they can um, have some uh, comedy uh, with other provider networks in, you know, in the location where they want to get it. Okay. I don't know if that's that's a, <laughs> sad. I'm aware of the issue. It's, it's you know, because of our federal system, it's, it's a little tricky. Yeah, and if I, I could, Dr. Cohen, just as a clarification, I mean, from the standpoint of the state marketplace or exchange, you must reside in New York State to purchase <coughs> on that marketplace. So, you know, there's these certainly contiguous states. Um, our colleagues in Connecticut operate a state-based marketplace. Our colleagues in New Jersey have deferred that. Uh, that responsibility to the federal government. So we hear the flip side as well of that, and that is that uh, there's individuals who ro reside in New York, but their usual medical shopping patterns may cross state borders. And whether or not the network adequacy requirements that the marketplace puts forward should permit consumers to have coverage for those uh, for doctors who just cross over the state line. So you know we, we hear that from and hospitals as well. So that's true in the North Country here with healthcare systems that operate in Vermont. It's true on the Pennsylvania border, on the Connecticut border, and certainly on the New Jersey border. So I, I mean I think it's it and we we heard some suggestions from consumers around that issue for the 2015 plan invitation for the marketplace. That's a cue into the next question. I have in my hand here this question for Donna. Uh, one of our doctors says that uh, he or she has a patient who just moved into New York State. Mm -hmm. The insurer is demanding proof of residence and therefore not issuing insurance until that proof of residence is provided. So the question is, what does the patient have to do to get coverage as time is running out? Yeah, um, that, that individual sh um, should, should be applying. If, if they're interested in purchasing marketplace coverage, um, and I'll defer to Troy on the residency um, process for outside the marketplace, but if they're interested in buying on the state marketplace, the residency requirement is something that they would need to document as part of or attest to as part of the application process. That's not a decision that the insurer or a determination that the insurer through the marketplace should be looking at. So I don't know if, 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 uh, that, if uh, the doctor's here in the room or maybe on the, the webinar, we certainly would like to hear the specifics of that. Um, we validate residency when someone applies through the website or they apply on the telephone or they apply with an in-person assister. I mean, Troy, I'll, I'll let you address on the out, you know, outside the marketplace. Yeah, outside the market, um, you know, the insurers have to submit to us their, uh, their residency requirements um, and, you know, what, what kinds of proof that are acceptable. Uh, generally speaking, the, the practical kinds of things that, you know, it, it may vary somewhat from insurer to insurer, but it's the kinds of things that you would expect, uh, anything from a driver's license to uh, utility bills to a lease to uh, things like that, that that show residency. Okay. Um, I have some other questions here. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to make these questions as brief as I can. 
Uh, for Donna, uh, this question is, one of the criticisms of the ACA is that the, while the premium is affordable, the out-of-pocket expense may be unaffordable, and what can be done in terms of regulation of health exchange to address that issue? Yeah, so um, the, the federal law sets forth the tiers of coverage that must be offered on state marketplaces, and we, we call them the precious metals, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, the, and the out-of-pocket cost depends on that metal tier, and we worked collaboratively with um, the actuaries at the Department of Financial Services to design plans within those actuarial requirements that we thought made sense for New Yorkers. Um, and the cost sharing for the member is the lowest at the platinum level. Um, it has an actuarial value of about 90%. It's highest at the bronze level. And so we're, we're required to offer plans as a marketplace at all four levels. I can tell you that from the early data we have, um, when we compare New York to the nation, um, and this data is all in the public domain, but um, New, York ten, New York consumers tend to be purchasing coverage that has a lower out-of-pocket cost. Um, when we look at the percentage of individuals in New York that per purchase platinum coverage, it is higher than uh, in the nation. And for people at certain income levels, when they buy silver coverage, um, their out-of-pocket costs are reduced as well because of those cost-sharing um, credits that I talked about uh, in my comments as I think, you know, very important for consumers. Um, so we'll continue to design and take a look again at the products that are offered on the marketplace, but we are operating within those requirements in the federal, in the federal law. Um, a fairly good percentage of people um, are purchasing plans that have no deductible between the number of people who are purchasing platinum plans and the number of people who are in the silver chair with, uh, with no deductible as well. Okay. I'm told I have time for one more question for our panel. And since I'm getting questions again about the 90-day question, uh, I, I thought we'd go back to that. The question is this. Can a physician ask for a deposit from the patient while waiting for the 90 days to pass? And alternatively, do you have any do's or don'ts for physicians who desire to collect deductibles or estimated fees for patients in advance? And uh, I guess I should ask uh, Donna that question first and then Troy. Yeah, we're looking at each other here <laughs> because I don't know that the question was posed to us as a deposit. I, I think the, the the question we typically get is whether or not the patient can be charged and, and whether or not um, uh, the, the, the dollar, the amount for the service can be collected during that period. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not certain about the deposit question. Uh, it's something we certainly can look at. Troy, you, you yeah, know? we can look at it. I mean, in, in general, uh, if it's like it or not, the way the federal rule came out is you're supposed to treat that person as in network until proven un otherwise. You, you know, they, so uh, if it's something that you could do to s with somebody who is in network that was, you know, legitimately uh, enrolled and didn't have a, um, uh, an, you know, a, a, a premium delay in paying their premium, I think you know that 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 would be okay. Um, I think that if if not, you you definitely want to get clear and check with somebody before doing that. Well, again, follow up. I guess the question is, what's the safe harbor in this? What about collecting a deductible or an estimated yeah. fee uh, up front? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Like any, this should be clear. Like yeah. it's just like any in-network service. If if they're uh, deductible is two thousand dollars, and your bill is fifteen hundred dollars. You can collect it because you can do that in, in, you know, with anybody who's who's in network because that's part of their deductible. So that is absolutely clear. That doesn't change. So the patient's cost sharing, yeah. in other words, whatever that is, whether it's a copayment or a deductible, if it's not been satisfied, can be collected. I think the question is whether or not there can be additional funds collected over and above that amount, which is something we, can, we certainly can all, uh, mm -hmm. can all go back and take a look at. Well, Donna and Troy, I want to thank you very much. You've been very gracious to answer all these questions. and You've been up here a long time doing so. <laughs> thank you indeed. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you very much for, for having us, Dr. Cohen, and thank you to, to all of you who, you know, you're, you're out there in the trenches every day doing, doing the good work, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move into the second half of our program. As promised, the first half had to do with the executive side of health care. Now this is the legislative side of health care, and 
The health care insurance legislative leaders that we've invited uh, this evening are Senator Kemp Hannon, Assemblyman Richard Gottfried, and Assemblyman Kevin Cahill, and I'll introduce each of them uh, individually as well. I'd like to ask each of these individuals, these esteemed individuals, to please join us at the, at the, the table here. We also have, uh, Kira's going to put out the name tags as we get set up for the second half of our program. If you're joining us now, again, uh, this is the Town Hall Forum on Healthcare Policy, Monday, March 10, 2014. I'm Jerry Cohen, the Speaker of the House of Delegates, acting as moderator, and my co-moderator is Kira uh, Jirasi uh, Chardulo, and we are moderating the Town Hall Forum, which is being sponsored by Meckel Society State of New York, today being Monday, March 10, 2014. And we are going to introduce people here. As they take their seats, I'll uh, say a few words of introduction. Uh, first, we have Senator Kemp Hannon, who is the chair of the Senate Health Committee. And uh, Senator Hannon represents New York's sixth, sixth Senate District, the area that encompasses the central communities of Nassau County. Senator Kemp has chaired numerous task forces, civic programs, and charitable endeavors. He has served as chairman of the prestigious Senate Committees on Health and Housing, and he is regarded as spearheading force behind both the reauthorization of the Health Care Reform Act and the development of New York's assisted living program. Additionally, Senator Hammond has helped the state enact several popular health programs, including Child Health Plus, Healthy New York, Family Health Plus, the Elderly Pharmaceutical Insurance Program, also known as EPIC, Early Intervention Efforts, Insurance Coverage for Autism, Prostate, and Breast Cancer Screenings. We also have Assemblyman Richard Gottfried, who is the chair of the Assembly Health Committee. Uh, Assemblyman Gottfried represents the 75th Assembly District, covering Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, Murray Hill, Midtown, part of Lincoln Center area of Manhattan. He is the chair of the Assembly Health Committee since 80, 1987. He is a leading state health policymaker, not only New York, but also nationally. He was a major architect of New York's landmark managed care reforms and continues to fight for stronger protections for consumers and health care providers and for public support for universal access to quality, affordable health care. And finally, we also have Assemblyman Kevin Cahill, who is the chair of the Assembly Insurance Committee. Um, Assemblyman Cahill's experience in Ulster County Legislature as the minority leader led him to um, apply, uh, run for office with the State Assembly in 1992, where he's been there ever since, where he's been a proven leader on civil rights, labor, and women's issues, and has been the forefront of the struggle to provide New Yorkers with quality, affordable health care. Uh, furthermore, when faced with a threat of state-mandated closure for one or more hospitals in the region, uh, the assembly member played an instrumental role in facilitating the affiliation of Benedictine, Kingston, and Margaretville hospitals. He successfully advocated for more than $47 million in state grants that were critical to the success of the hospital mergers in his area. So we have very esteemed individuals here, and we have... Um, Assemblyman Cahill and Senator Hannon, and and we have Dick, is Dick Gottfried. I see him in the back. He's out eating carrots. Very healthy indeed. And Assemblyman Gottfried. That's you. Rose between two thorns. Okay. I would like to give each of you. Uh, the privilege of having uh, uh, five minutes, if you'd like to have five minutes to say something to our audience. Um, I would like to start with Senator Hannon first and ask if you'd like to make a few comments. Uh, again, very brief, three to five minutes. Well, I'd like to make some comments, and I'm just going to do it to address the items that are on the Medical Society's um, uh, agenda of concerns for this year's budget. Now, we're right now in the middle of the whole budget process. Uh, Spent all the last I'm sorry, can everybody hear Senator Hand in the back? I don't think your mic's on, Ken. Um, you know what? Uh, it's on, but it's not. Let's, let's give him the green light. Let's try the green light one. Now. Can you hear Senator Hand now in the back? Now can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Uh, much you. better. No, the button didn't work on the other one. Um, I just wanted to address uh, the items that are on MISNI's list of concerns for the budget, uh, a process that we're now undergoing, um, hopefully conclude with uh, a budget by a little bit before the end of this month. This will require us to have 
um, individual um, House uh, budgets and resolutions, and then uh, meet and negotiate on uh, any differences. I don't know why they'd be any different than what I want, but um, that's been the rumor. The uh, I would support the um, you want the continuation of the fully funded excess medical liability program. Um, I. I think we've, it's, it's been working pretty well, and we don't have really um, any complaints about that except to make it wider. Um, patient access to physician of choice, we obviously have legislation on that, and I would imagine that there is going to be considerable discussion. Um, the governor, for the first time, put in uh, some uh, provision for it, and uh, I believe we have to go much further than where the governor is. We've been working. Um, with your representatives all weekend on our proposal. Um, urgent care, office-based surgery. Um, while uh, some point in the future there might be reasons to move ahead on that, and I know there's a proliferation of urgent care centers or offices in the state, I don't see that there is enough of a nexus to have any regulation um, at this point in time. Office-based surgery. Uh, this society led uh, changes uh, in the law so that it, there is past current office-based surgery certification, uh, thresholds, et cetera. There's been a proposal by the governor to um, widen the standards, increase some of the thresholds, um, and yet uh, we have not been uh, presented with any evidence uh, that would indicate um, problems that need to be resolved. So I am not in favor of changing the standards at this time for office-based surgery, uh, especially when we have uh, insurance companies refusing to recognize their, their validity in the healthcare spectrum. Um, you are objecting to the corporately owned retail clinics and in, in uh, stores in the state. I'm not so sure that's had a decent reception. It has had a decent reception in the Senate um, and so I'm not so sure we're going along with your view on that. Uh, the nurse practitioners practicing independently, um, some of the proposals have been rejected, but that's at the table uh, with higher education in, in the Senate because, <clears throat> as you know, the regulation of the nursing profession is with the state education department. Um, the written consent on offering an HIV test, um, I think to the, to the date, we have not um, addressed that in our Senate uh, review, mainly because I have said I was part of the original um, establishment of consent for the HIV test, uh, and was in favor of widening its application, uh, but I really wanted to hear from the interested parties. And when we made that discussion, it was last Thursday, I had not heard. Um, I also want to hear from the people in the gay community. Um, they had been very involved at the beginning. And then lastly, <clears throat> uh, as we were doing some uh, review with people in emergency rooms last year throughout the state, the comment was made, you did require um, offering of the HIV test in emergency rooms, but that is not an especially conducive place to do it. There's other missions in the EDs, and if I have a chance, I'll probably want to omit offering it in the emergency rooms just because of the appropriateness of doing it. Um, those, are, those are the items that you have there. Uh, the one-sided no-fault reform, uh, that's at another table dealing with codes. And I do think that the, I'm up with my five minutes and I'll let it go at that. Okay, Senator Ham, that was extremely helpful. I think that uh, the folks in the back were taking notes quite furiously and we thank you for the, those very candid comments. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize Assemblyman Richard Gottfried, Chair of the Assembly Health Committee, for three to five minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. The, the folks in the back who are taking notes, um, I think, have already taken notes on all of my views on the, the items in, in your agenda. What I'd like to do is use my time to talk about uh, one, maybe two issues. Um, that are uh, not on most people's radar. Uh, I believe we are on the verge, and by we I mean not only your patients but uh, you as well, are on the verge of a 
major invasion of large corporations into controlling professional practice. And I believe they will be doing this without anybody having to change a single law or regulation in the state of New York. You know, when, when CVS announced that they were no longer going to be selling tobacco in their stores, people wondered, gee, why are they giving up that revenue? What, what's in it for them? And a couple of business commentators said, this is part of their long-range rebranding of the company. They don't want to be where you go for pretzels and beer and beef jerky. They want to be where you go not only for prescriptions and Band-Aids, but where you go for lab tests and where you go to see your doctor. And we already have Dwayne Reed uh, in New York City, and I assume Walgreens is doing it around the state, renting clinics in their pharmacies to physicians, exactly what CVS wants to do, except instead of owning the clinic, they're renting it. We've got the Price Chopper supermarket chain here in the Albany area doing the same, opening clinics in their stores. Any day now, Toys R Us uh, in aisle six <laughs> will have the pediatrician there. You think that's funny. They, those corporations have access to advertising money that you will never have. They can afford to, uh, to finance equipment and electronic health records systems and everything else that you will never be able to afford. And they'll rent it to you just like they'll rent the space to you. And as part of the rental agreement, they will also provide you with the managers of your practice. And every bit of that will be perfectly legal. And I don't think doctors in New York are going to welcome competing with the advertising and financing uh, and, and, and other powers that the doctors who set up shop at Toys R Us or Walmart will have at their disposal. And shortly, those economically powered entities will seriously undermine, if not wipe out, uh, the form of professional practice uh, that we have all known uh, all our lives and for several previous generations. And I don't think any of us will welcome that world, but there is nothing in our law today to stop it from happening. And if you think that a tenant who, on a short lease, that includes a management contract, that includes renting all your equipment and renting your electronic health records from your landlord, if you think that preserves professionalism one whit more than if you were an employee of a CVS clinic, I think you're mistaken. Sharecroppers did not enjoy a whole lot of freedom. And while you are all way out of the league in terms of training and skill of any sharecropper, and I don't mean to compare you, uh, you know, to, to farmers, but the economic power of the corporate landlord uh, will be enormous. And the freedom that you will have and the professionalism that you will have, I believe, will be quickly dwindled. And I think New York needs to do something about that. Well, we thank you for those comments. Actually, you're not the first individual to compare farmers and physicians. <laughs> because these are the only two professions I'm aware of where we buy retail and sell wholesale. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Anyway, I would also like to give three to five minutes to Assemblyman Kevin Cahill, Chair of the Assembly Insurance Committee. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, as you can see, my counterpart in the Senate is not here. Um, I don't know whether he was smart enough to uh, 
to dodge this one or, or, or if he had a conflict. My guess is he had a conflict, so I know he has a great deal of respect for this organization and counts on your good advice every chance he can get. But I'm extremely honored to be uh, sitting here with the two real known experts on health care in the New York State government. Uh, these two gentlemen between them have more experience, more knowledge, and, and more studiousness on the issues than the next five people in state government. So uh, it's always good to sit. Uh, and, and, and hear what's on their minds and to hear their analyses because it's, it's usually spot on. Uh, even when we don't philosophically agree, there's a great reason to pay careful attention to what Kemp and Dick have to say. Uh, they, they've paid a lot of attention. I will, I will share this about Kemp. Um, I've been at insurance conferences where, where Kemp has been a sought after speaker and leader on the subject. Uh, and. Uh, and I've been uh, in the assembly long enough to hear virtually every person who ever walks through the door with their first health care question know right where to go and go to Dick. So, so uh, uh, it's, it's a great privilege. Flattery uh, will get you anything you want. Right. <laughs> that means but I can, get, I I can get any Godfrey bill passed that I care about. Right. Yes. <laughs> but I don't know that saying we know more than the rest of the state government makes people <laughs> more scared of the rest of the state government. Well, now you're getting to the second part of my speech. <laughs> No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, there are several issues that are coming up in the budget, and I think that's what's really on everybody's mind right now. Uh, we have the rest of the session to deal with the rest of the session, and on that note, one of the things that I think we should deal with in the rest of the session is the question of automobile insurance, no fault, and how we're going to go about bringing uh, the cost of insurance under control and to put some checks and balances into the system. We are not convinced that what the governor is proposing uh, in his budget is, is, uh, is necessary, timely, adequate, or well-defined. Uh, although we, we certainly applaud the idea of, of moving forward on it, I suspect that when we come out with our budget in the next couple of days, we are going to suggest that we wait till after the April 10th hearing on that subject that the Assembly Insurance Committee will be conducting. I'll be chairing it. So uh, it will certainly be part of the topics that we'll be, we'll be discussing. Uh, for the time being, I don't think it's, uh, I, 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 I think I'm repeating what Kemp said. I don't think it's ripe for discussion at this particular point in time. Oh, actually, he said it's in somebody else's shop. Um, <clears throat> On some of the other issues, excess med mal, we are in complete agreement with what Senator Hannon said, and we think that the program has to continue. We also are taking great pains to make sure that it is, it is not diminished by attrition. Uh, you know, we are in era of hospital closures, hospital contraction, and if those hospitals have physicians that are working in there and, and taking advantage of these policies, we want to make sure that the policies follow them or some other mechanism is put in place to assure that we don't see a de facto reduction of the excess pool. So we're continuing to monitor that, but by and large, I think we're on the same page. I think you're going to see some good progress there. Um, we are also working, uh, although the budget doesn't have a whole lot in it right now that I'm aware of, on, on the ACA. Having just come back from a conference of the many states, uh, I can tell you that uh, we're better off than most states from virtually every single perspective. Our program is further along, better subscribed, fewer complaints, uh, even our website worked better. So uh, um, you have a lot of people who are looking to New York to see how, how they can do it right. And, and uh, I think that, that uh, over the course of the next couple of years, as it was described to me in one of these conferences a few months ago, as not turning an ocean liner around, but turning 10 ocean liners around simultaneously. Uh, and so we should never minimize the magnitude of what's happening under the ACA. And that means we should be attending to every detail. Uh, one of the details of the ACA is that we, we as a government now, as a policy of the Congress of the United States signed by law to the pre by the President, it's something that we in New York adopted on our own, have said that networks matter, that insurance companies have to make sure that they give you, the consumers, uh, the adequate level of, of representation of the professions within health care so that you can get your care uh, from those networks. Well, in New York, we use those words like adequate network, but we don't really define them in any specific way that has teeth. So uh, one of the things that we'll be looking at is to make sure that when we start to talk about what a network is and whether it is adequate, whether it meets the standards, that we not only have a clearer, maybe modern, something close to the 21st century definition of it, the definitions are all about 35 years old, uh, and that we also put in place some teeth to enforce that with healthcare. Uh, because here's, here's the most important thing. The network determination by both the insurance company and the provider should be about quality. 
It should be about access. It should be about what works best for the provision of health care. It should not be about moving to that forum for the purposes of negotiating fees. So we're going to try to do what we can to make sure that adequacy of network is better defined and that there's more enforcement. And that brings us to the next part that's in the budget, and that's the governor's proposal for out-of-network coverage. Uh, there are many aspects of it, I think, that, are, that we're very glad to see moving along. They've been in bills in both houses for many years, and there are some other things that need to be looked at even further. Uh, again, definitions. What, 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 what are the actual meanings of the terms? We don't want to provide discretion necessarily to a regulator to make a determination that we don't think um, is, is consistent with what would be a common person's definition. And in that regard, we want to expand the safeguards for consumers so that when consumers are securing health care and deciding between uh, payment sources, they have a full uh, breadth of knowledge of what's out there. Uh, Long story short is I think we are going to see an out-of-network uh, resolution sometime this year, and it may very well be part of the budget that's proposed. I think when you see our one-house bill uh, on the budget, you're going to see that, the, that we're more alike than we are different with both uh, Senator Hannon's proposal and, and Assemblyman Gottfried's former, uh, uh, actually still proposal, uh, and what the governor is proposing. So we have a, a short way to go on what has been a very long walk, and I hope that uh, uh, we'll be all happy when it's all said and done. With that, I turn it back to the experts. Well, thank you very much. Um, Assemblyman Cahill, uh, I have several questions here. Actually, the first is for uh, Assemblyman Cahill, and it's a question regarding uh, collective bargaining. Uh, the question is, do you believe that physicians should be able to collectively negotiate with insurance companies with government oversight over that process? The problem being this. A physician is currently being given a contract by an insurance company the insurance company is in a much more powerful negotiating position than a single physician. Oftentimes, the physician is given a contract, take it or leave it. These contracts often have clauses in them that are harmful to the interests of patients and or the physician. So regarding this collective bargaining question, um, the question again is, do you believe physicians should be able to collectively negotiate with insurance companies? Yes, I do. We have two bills in the assembly. That's a wealth of bills. Anytime there's more than a Gottfried bill, that's a lot. Um, so. <laughs> And uh, by coincidence, one of them is a Gottfried bill. Uh, and, and I think if you look at Assemblyman Gottfried's bill, you're going to see that it's definitional and really lays out the process by which uh, uh, physicians can collectively bargain. And if you look at Assemblyman Pretlow's bill, you're going to see that it provides the authorizations necessary. So we have a, a, a plan in place to do this. I think that both bills together uh, really do complete the picture and uh, recognize the, the uh, um, the need to, to go forward and allow collective bargaining uh, amongst physicians. Yes, and also I guess the question could be turned around this way. We're talking about collective negotiation with insurance companies. What about collective negotiation with the CVSs? <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to address the, the minute clinic or whatever it's called. Um, you know, I just by sheer timing coincidence, last week we had some physicians in, a longtime friend of mine who runs an urgent care clinic, and short time later, a few minutes later, we were meeting with the folks from CBS about their proposal uh, to set up this nurse practitioner based uh, remote physician supervised uh, health care clinic. Um, and, it, and it struck me how, how uninformed I was about urgent clinics, and I think I'm pretty common when it comes to what a consumer sees. I perceive them, in my mind, as a standalone oper uh, emergency room, as an institutional setting where maybe there would be doctors present. I didn't perceive it as a medical practice, as a doctor's practice with a focus on urgent care. And uh, if, if, if I can render one piece of advice from being the consumer guy on the panel, uh, it would be that, that physicians would be well placed to carefully brand uh, the services that they're doing and, and be very proud to put that shingle out, put MD after their name so that people know when they're going to a doctor, they're going to a doctor. Uh, and that will, in the beginning, start to distinguish you from some of the other providers. And the answer to your question is yes. Okay. And, and a corollary to that would be, uh, what about concerns about violations of state and federal anti-kickback statutes about these clinics? Uh, a patient comes into the clinic and they get a pharmacy prescription and the pharmacy prescription being actually filled in that same um, uh, Again, uh, what I'm trying to say is we have laws against physicians doing this. Aren't there laws about the retail clinics doing this in reverse? What about the anti-kickback statutes? Well, 
the uh, first of all, that law should certainly apply there under the uh, the, the limited services clinic uh, proposal in the governor's budget. Uh, there is an anti-kickback statute uh, provision that that incorporates by reference that statute, uh, so that would apply. Uh, just as it would, I mean, you would have the same question uh, for the uh, the price chopper uh, rented clinic uh, on their premises, uh, and the same rule should and would apply. Yes, Senator Hanna. Let me. Uh, I want to take a variation of all of that because we don't change any of the laws, but there are already the. T uh, limits of the, anti the Stark laws being tested because many of the ASOs uh, that are established in the state are from direct uh, funding from the CMS, and so that's going on. And I know uh, Assemblyman Gottfried has worked long and hard in regard to having a state program in regard to ASOs, but in no way could we ever... Uh, ACOs. ACOs, excuse me. Um, acronym overdose. Um, no way can we um, repeal any of the stark provisions. But I wanted to go back to something that um, we're, we're circling around, and that is the proposal on urgent care. One of the reasons that I espouse rejecting what the governor has done and leaving the field untouched at the moment is that the urgent care is based on a physician's own license. There's no other certification or anything like that. It's not. And, um, uh, an office-based surgery, which we have re uh, certification required from a national entity. So if we start to limit the use of the word urgent care, we have to set up some standard as to what it means. We have to ask who's making that uh, use of it. And uh, we have to basically start to look at an individual physician's practice. And I'm not willing to go there yet because I don't believe it's thought out. Um, because the next level over the horizon is the multiple physician practices where there is an inclination to try to set up some regulations. And I'm not talking about five of your colleagues. I'm talking about 200 practicing together. Now, that's not, there's no proposal to regulate them whatsoever. And especially, I point out, what's a large physician practice? Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it 40? What's the nature of the affiliation? One location, several locations, only by computers. We need to think out what we're doing. Now, I also have my grave doubts and have rave, raised flags about the thing called, the proposed thing called a shiny, which would take seven, $95 million of money out of HICRA so we'd unite all of the RIOs, the regional health exchange uh, groups, and they're supposed to be having physicians involved in it. Well, once we start to set up this shiny, what are we doing in regard to the electronic medical records that are in your practices, that people are trying to encourage? I don't believe we've thought all of this out sufficiently so that if Dick wants to espouse a traditional practice and allow you to go forward and do that, that's fine, but how are we gonna do it? And in what way are we gonna do it? So there, there's a lot of thought going into this, and I don't believe there's any conclusion, but I believe this concept of what the individual physician practice is ought to be discussed and how you aggregate, how you practice together, what an ACO is, and, and et cetera. Yeah. Um, Assemblyman Godfrey, would you like to comment on that? Uh, no. Point counterpoint. Uh, maybe we're not. It's not a counterpoint. Pick, pick a point. I mean, uh, <laughs> I I certainly agree. There there are a lot of details out there that need to be worked out. And yeah, large uh, a large two hundred physician practice uh, that is act that is predominantly run by a fairly small handful of those 200 and the rest are employees, um, 
can be something you need to be concerned about. I, I think it can be a perfectly fine way to, to organize uh, a, a, the way you practice. Uh, it may not be the way that everybody wants to practice, uh, but it may well be a, a reasonable option. But because of the, the power not only of the total entity, but of the handful of people who run it, uh, there probably ought to be uh, some new regulations uh, looked at. Okay. Speaking of new regulations, uh, one more question on this topic before I go on to something else. The question is, what's the difference if CVS owns practices or the hospital owns practices, or if one or two individuals own large practices? What's the difference? I'm not sure there's an answer to that, but it's something to think about. It, 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 it's a good question. and. There are a lot of differences between working in a small organization uh, that a handful of partners control and being an employee of a, of a large organization. I, I think there is a difference between being an employee of a hospital that, that has state regulation and, uh, and is not uh, owned and accountable to a for-profit corporation on the one hand and being an employee of, of, a, of a practice that is owned, whether it's by CVS or you know, Walmart or the local Chevy dealer uh, in, in terms of what the values are, if any, that, that, that the owner believes in uh, and is pursuing. And, so I, I think we need some very strong limitations on these retail-sponsored clinics, whether they are retail-sponsored on a rental basis or retail-sponsored on an ownership basis. Ultimately, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. I think both kinds need some very strong uh, state regulations and limitations on what they can do. Okay, moving on. I'm seeing lots of questions regarding workers' comp. And uh, the question I'd like to address to Assemblyman Cahill is, workers' comp, any thought on reforming a system which has become so difficult for patients that an injured person practically has to hire a lawyer just to negotiate the system? It's one of my favorite subjects because my answer is two words. Carl Hasty. He's the chair of the Labor Committee, and workers' comp comes under his jurisdiction, not mine, so I don't have to deal with it. I, I have a different two-word answer, which is single payer. Single payer. <laughs> okay. And Senator Hannon? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, the Medicaid primary care incentive payment that brings Medicaid payment for fee-for-service to parity with Medicare expires December 31, 2014. The question is, do you support adding the primary care incentive payments into this budget covering January 2015 through March, um, um, well, anyway, the, this coming budget? And I guess the question really should be addressed, I guess, to somebody even Gottfried first. I'll repeat it again if you'd like. Yeah, no, uh, that would certainly be a good thing to do. I don't know what the, I mean, I haven't heard that issue raised, uh, I don't think, in the context of this budget yet. I think we extended yeah. it. Have we? I, yeah, but this brings up another, this brings up another question is we really need to put on the table as to what's happening. There's two direc directions of things happening in the state that, that really you need to be cognizant of. I would ex favor extending that. But we right now have um, a total move to try to find every corner of healthcare in this state and to put it into managed care. If you really think that Dick's down on retail, you should hear him discuss how down he is on insurance companies, which after you hear a lot of horror stories, it's hard to be for. Um, but managed care, whether it's care management, managed care, even populations such as small as those who are in foster care, when you take a look at that population, it's, we're not doing well in their health care to begin with because we have 20 big agencies and we're doing health care in 20 different ways for them. 
but it also goes to uh, the developmentally disabled, the people who have behavioral health problems, substance abuse problems, people who are both in Medicare and Medicaid. These are major uh, populations the state is going to uh, try to address in different fashion than ever before. So that is one big problem as to if you're unhappy with insurance companies right now um, or uh, even Medicaid managed care uh, companies right now, there's going to be even more opportunity to be unhappy. This, it's, it's, this, is what ha this is a major philosophy, and it's not just, by the way, in New York. This, this is very pervasive throughout the country. Um, I'm, I can't tell you I see any studies that say the care is better, but from the government bureaucrats' standpoint, they have less to do. They can just look at the bottom line. That's not a great thing, obviously, because in health, we're all really the primary goal is, is the patient. The second part of it is the waiver. This is often discussed unless you're focused on it, um, and it's very easy to miss being focused on it because there's no specific yet. This is a major negotiation with uh, the, the federal government, CMS, between the state Department of Health and CMS. The ostensible purpose of the waiver is to reduce hospital admissions by 25% over five years. 25%. Now, I don't know if we're just going to find a new way of people not getting ill or whatever have you, but the way, the way that they would propose to do it is by major collaborations, putting in the primary care physician, putting in clinics, putting in nursing homes, putting in hospitals, even those that have already big integrated systems, making sure that they go and collaborate as much as possible. The rubric would be uh, medical homes and the, uh, the um, uh, I think the guideline, the, uh, the, the uh, program that says what it is, is all listed under the State Health Improvement Program, SHIP, and it's there and you need to read it to get a sense of the direction uh, that the state is going. $8 billion. People think, well, grants, we'll get some for medical records, we'll get some for building. Federal government says no IT, no construction. Next part of it is the state has said we intend to only have 50 awards for the $8 billion. That's an incredible amount of collaboration that I'll start to have to take place. So that as we're looking for what's the doctor's office, what's the retail clinic, it's going to have to be a lot closer and a lot more integrated than we've ever had before. And a lot more medical records, a lot more collaboration. That's just things that are on the table. It's not necessarily things we've seen yet. We'll want to have input for the legis legislature, not because we know more, but we'll be stand-ins for you, we'll be stand-ins for hospitals, we'll be stand-ins for nursing homes, <clears throat> so that is there, the policies that will be introduced are discussed. These will be all part of a health community discussion in the state. Okay. I've been asked to ask questions about collective negotiations again. We've passed it in the Senate, and we may well pass it again, but we've passed it. And indeed, they referenced the Hannon Gottfried S3690 and A5692 uh, bills from a couple of years ago, passed in the Senate, and had more than 60 co sponsors in the Assembly, but didn't move in the Assembly. So the question is this how can we get the same bills passed from both houses and to the governor, to the governor's desk? How can that uh, be accomplished? So I'll address this to our Assemblyman, uh, Assemblyman Gottfried. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think if the Senate passes it again, that'll help. Uh, secondly, I think, I think the profession needs to have uh, a, a serious sit-down conversation with Speaker Silver and with some of the people around him uh, about the legislation uh, and, and, and its importance. I think at this stage, he sees it as a bill that basically raises the cost of, uh, of the services insurance companies pay for, and aren't we trying to do the opposite? Uh, I think there is, well, and we all agree, there is a lot more to that legislation, uh, and a lot that would actually, I think, help to uh, not only improve the quality, but help to control the cost of health care. That, that message needs to go from the profession uh, into his thinking, and it's not there yet. 
And Assemblyman Cahill, uh, any comments? Well, first I want to just expand a little bit on the workers' comp answer. Just to tell you, yes, I think the system is wildly broken and it does need to be fixed. I was making light of the fact that it's under a colleague's uh, jurisdiction, but it's certainly something we're all paying attention to. I've not had anybody coming into our office to say, please maintain the workers' comp system. It's working wonderfully. Um, uh, I, in fact, I don't know anybody who thinks it's working well, and that, that to me uh, is, is demonstration that maybe it's time to look at it. The only concern I have about looking at it is that we have looked at it a couple of times, and when we fixed it, it just got worse. So uh, I want to I want to be careful about where we go forward, but it is certainly something that's on all of our minds. In terms of uh, Dick's bill, you should know. Please don't hold it against Dick. He's been very good to the sponsor of the bill. He's moved it out of the health committee. Um, he's the sponsor of the bill. Uh, so, <coughs> so it's moved out of health. It sits in ways and means right now, Dick, or uh, single pipe. No, no, the uh, collective <laughs> oh, bargaining. Collective negotiation. Yeah, it's uh, it maybe in code. Ways and means. Ways and means. Ways and means. Okay. So, and, and, I, and I agree with Dick that, that the, the entire range of values that are at stake <laughs> ought to be talked about. And, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to put the cards on the table. I've operated in, you know, all different aspects of health care in my life, but mostly as a consumer uh, and mostly as the most precious resource in health care. All due respect to physicians, the most precious resource in health care are patients. We're the ones that it's all about, right? And uh, how those patients pay for their care and how much they pay for the care is the keystone to making a system work. When everybody loved Medicare, Medicare had a fee schedule that was pretty representative of what it cost to actually provide care. When, when in those few minutes back in 65, I think it was August, when everybody loved Medicaid, uh, the same circumstance existed. But when we started to see the, 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 the divergence of points of view on those two subjects, it was when the Medicaid fee schedule started to plummet and the Medicare fee schedule continued to reflect the actual experience of real life. Uh, what we see today, oh, and, and by the way, the same was true in the early days of managed care. In the early days of managed care, there were many, many doctors who were at the forefront of making it happen and recognizing that it wasn't about pushing down uh, the, the amount that providers got, but instead it was about finding a way to spend that health care dollar more wisely. Uh, it was about forcing collaboration where collaboration didn't exist. When it became about pushing down uh, the amount that was paid to a provider, that is when it too started to fall apart. So let's face the elephant in the room. It's about, uh, it's about the fee that, that uh, providers are getting. And then the other side of the equation, what's pushing up the cost of health care? One of the things that's pushing up the cost of health care is how much we pay an individual provider for health care. But there's a lot more to it than that's pushing it up. And I think what we're seeing under the waiver is an effort on the part of uh, of uh, the federal government at least to start to say, come on, let's try something. Let's see if we can make it work. I sat down with my hospitals as they're collaborating as possibly becoming participants in this program, hopefully uh, being part of it and not being the victim of it because they're the ones that have to reduce their admissions. And they're talking about absolutely everything. They're talking about going out into the community. It reminded me of my old experience back in the, in the 90s with the SHMOs, the social HMOs, where they took control of the lives of the patients that they were dealing with in, in a good way, not in a, not in a negative way, where they went out and they reached out and they found out what was really needed for those folks. If we can do that, if we can reduce the need for health care and cut costs, that's a good thing. But if we just cut the price of health care or where we spend the dollars, that's not a good thing. So we have a long way to go. On the collective bargaining bill, um, you have a, a, a great uh, advocate in, in, uh, in both Kemp and, and in Dick and, uh, uh, and in Gary as well with his bill. And uh, I would just urge you to, to uh, make sure that people are understanding the full uh, set of values that are at stake. It's not just about what, what it costs for health care. It is so oftentimes about making sure that there's a level playing field and a, and a, and a means by which people can negotiate fairly. A follow-up question uh, actually for uh, Mr. Cahill is about the fee schedule for workers' comp and no-fault auto. Apparently this is among the lowest, among the na uh, lowest in the states among the nation. So any thoughts about raising the fee schedule or uncoupling workers' comp from no-fault? Yeah. Um, uh, the, you know, in terms of the fee schedules under those two areas, th those are all something that I think are ripe for review. Uh, again, uh, I think the, the way that we really save money instead of just postponing uh, the, the paying out of money is to, uh, is to find ways to do things better and smarter and to actually bring people uh, to a point of health or to prevent 
uh, further disease states or whatever we're working from. That's the way we're going to do it. It's, you know, we, we've, we've become in this country um, folks that talk about health care as if it's, we're talking about health insurance. And we ought to get back to talking about health care. Uh, in terms of the fee schedules, we have to have realistic fee schedules no matter what the paradigm is that we're providing the care under. I have a question here I've been asked to address, I guess, to Senator Hannon. It has to do with sunsetting of state mandates on clinical practice. The fact is that we have increasing numbers of mandates that have accumulated um, almost exponentially over the years. We're talking about mandates for HIV, hepatitis C, sepsis training, protocols, education mandates on child abuse, infection control, new ones now announced that are being proposed for pain management. Um, isn't there a time to say at some point, what is the straw that breaks the camel's back? What's the straw on the back of the practicing physician? At what point too, should we be having some type of review for sunsetting some of these? these uh, programs, especially insofar as they're on the books for sometimes decades and don't really keep up with what's happening. To the extent that um, they are outmoded, they should be uh, done away with. The example in the middle of the question was about Hep C. We passed that last year, and we put in it a time limit of five years. And we did not make it applicable to everybody, but just those born between 1945 and 1965, and um, a fine group of people. Well, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you divide it by two and go to November. Um, yeah, the, the baby boomers. I'm one, I'm one. I'm ten days into it, and it's the yeah. most self-indulgent uh, demographic we've ever had. What's wrong with that? <laughs> um, but we we sunsetted it. Five years. The thought was that you deal with the problem with that population because it wasn't just drug abusers. It turned out to be those who uh, uh, were inducted into the Army for the Vietnam draft. They line up the people, bear your arm, uh, go down the line, give you a shot, same needle, uh, same syringe, and uh, that's how some of it was transmitted. The rest of it is it requires a review and uh, to take a look at it and see where we are. As I said before about the HIV, when we're doing the hep C, emergency room doc said, this is a terrible place for us to offer things. So when I get a chance, i got to talk to Dick, but I really want to talk to the rest of the healthcare community, go back and exempt the emergency rooms for that. Um, the, the other ones, um, they're going to have policies. You mentioned <coughs> there's a thing, that online training course you have to take. Um, that is in regard to the child abuse. I'm sure that that will, that's a mandate, but I'm sure there's people who feel strongly about that mandate. So each one has a separate policy, uh, need to work with the uh, people, mo the population most directly affected, and then by yourselves who have to implement that policy and to see what moves things forward. Yeah. And, you know, things can change. Uh, the most dramatic uh, is one of the things that Kemp mentioned earlier on, which is the line in the governor's budget that would eliminate the requirement in most circumstances that consent to an HIV test be written. And, you know, I drafted the legislation that imposed that requirement in 1988, uh, as recently as, I don't know, three or four years ago when we were making some changes. Uh, in that legislation, if anyone had suggested, uh, well, many people did, but if we had, if there had been an effort uh, to remove the written consent requirement, even three or four years ago, uh, the, the, there would have been hell to pay. People would have been tearing down the Capitol. Uh, several of my colleagues would have been incensed. But my sense, going back to 1988, was that that requirement was there because of the way HIV and AIDS were regarded by a large part of the population at that time, and that there would come a point where the, the fear and, and the ignorance and, and the stigma uh, would be worn down. And I think we are at that point, because when that language appeared in the governor's budget, we did not hear a peep. You know, none of the organizations that would have been screaming bloody murder three or four years ago had a word. None of my colleagues who would have been 
hollering about that three or four years ago have mentioned it. We had to call GMHC and say, you know, you know this is here. We haven't heard from you. We just want to make sure you're okay. And they said, oh, yeah, no problem. Uh, it, to me, it's a, it is a stunning development. Welcome, because of the, the, the circumstances that lead to that change in attitude are certainly long, over, long awaited and welcome. Uh, but attitudes change. The facts on the ground change. The legislature needs to keep up with those facts on the ground. And part of this profession's job and every profession's job, you know, since none of us t actually takes care of anybody, uh, we all need to hear from all of you uh, to keep us going in, in, in the right direction. Well, here's some feedback. Uh, are you aware that even the Empire Plan will not pay for the hepatitis C test? <laughs> I specifically spoke with them before we passed it, and they said they were quite happy to pay for it because the resulting cost of treating somebody for the liver disease was extraordinarily high. Now, I, to the extent if somebody hasn't gotten it. Now, the other question is, which empire plan? We've gone through and found out there are about two or three. Some are on the exchange, some are not in the exchange, some are quasi in the exchange, a thing called empire pathways, which after trying to help somebody get their operation, uh, what at four o'clock in the afternoon when they've been off meds all, all day, they were told, no, your 6 o'clock a.m. the next day is not going to be done because you're on pathway. I mean, it's, it, it is amazingly confusing, but I specifically spoke with them on that. Well, for the individual doctor that wrote that question, please uh, supply Ms. Nee with further information about which plan, et cetera, specific information. We will pass along to Senator Hannon's office and we'll follow up on that, but we need some more specific information. Um, I've been told that I need to ask questions about nurse practitioners. So I've got a couple here and very few minutes left, so I'm going to ask this question. Uh, nurse practitioner's licensing exam, why just an RN uh, exam for a nurse practitioner? Why not something more substantial for their licensing exams? I, I was on the understanding it's a master's in nursing. Well, we're talking about the licensing exam, not just, not, not just the degree they need to have. Well, the license exam they, by the state. In order to be a nurse practitioner, you go through an additional level of certification by state ed, uh, I'd have to go look back at the statute and see whether, wh how, it, what it speaks of in terms of whether there's an exam involved or not. But state ed uh, certainly has authority to uh, uh, to require compliance with with curriculum and training, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question regarding nurse practitioners. It's a little bit long. Uh, but I'll read it. Instead of using nurse practitioners to substitute for primary care physicians in, providing, in providing care to patients in underserved areas in New York State, would it make more sense to increase funding for the Doctors Across New York program so that it can provide loan repayment and practice support to more physicians? The issue being that there are a number of physicians that would uh, qualify, but the program only got half full because of funding uh, uh, deficits. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the money that's there this year only funds those who are already in the program, pays for it. Uh, the Senate would uh, uh, propose to have money for considerably more slots for new people and then to continue with those who are already in the program. So both are absolutely needed uh, to uh, keep this program going. Frankly, to the extent there were slots available, um, we'd go beyond that. And I'm not so sure. It takes a while to gear up to create it within your entity and to recruit people to be in the program. You know, un until a couple of years ago, we kept the spending in that program down by making it almost impossible for anybody to apply for and, 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 and be approved for it. Uh, we fixed that, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago, and so the program is filling up. Now we need to provide the money, and uh, I hope we can... Uh, nail down what the, and, and, and meaning get done, uh, what the Senate is, is going to propose. Uh, I don't think it's a question of, of 
allowing experienced nurse practitioners to practice with a backup agreement instead of a written collaborative agreement versus doctors across New York, I think we can and should do both. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question. I've been told this is an important one, so I should ask it. And I'll start with Selmyman Cahill, and the question is this. Uh, we had heard earlier from Troy Oshner that uh, there's a proposed legislation regarding out-of-network reimbursements to uh, limit that uh, regarding the surprise uh, bills that people are getting in the emergency rooms and the hospitals, and that there's a mechanism to have out-of-network reimbursements set at 80% of fair health as the reasonable standard. The question is this. Will you support out-of-network reimbursement up to 80% of fair health as a reasonable standard? Well, there certainly are proposals, both the governor's proposal and I think, I don't know if the Senate proposal is out or it's on its way out. out um, and the assembly proposal will be out later this week and it will indicate what we're, what we're willing to agree to and what we're not. I will give you a tip off of my position. Um, we need uh, a, a clear, objective, readily determinable fee schedule. It should be representative of the cost of care. It should not be unduly favor one side or the other. It should be one that neither encourages uh, 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 health plans from making very narrow networks or discourages doctors from joining networks. It should be one that becomes benign and not part of the equation. That's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, what should we use? Well, you know, right now 80% of fair health is what's being talked about. The problem we have with fair health is that uh, it expires this year from in terms of the subscription on the part of the health plans and uh, there, I haven't heard a lot of health plans saying that they're clamoring to resubscribe. Uh, so what happens at the end of what happens at the end of the year when Fair Health starts to have a little problem with its data? I don't know. We do have another solution, however. We have a mandate on the state of New York uh, that we create an all-payer database, and we could refer to that all-payer database and then determine whatever is the appropriate ratio of that all-payer database to arrive at uh, at what is a fair uh, recompense for the services that are offered. Uh, in terms of what we support in the budget, let me be perfectly clear what the goal of the assembly is, and I, and I don't speak necessarily just for Dick, I think I speak for all of us. Uh, we want to see an out-of-network benefit, particularly getting rid of surprise bills. I think that's something we would like to do uh, before the end of this session, and if at all possible, because of the sensitivities of the subject, and we know how when we have particularly sensitive subjects, the best place to deal with them is deep, deep, deep within the thousands of pages of the budget, um, that in fact that's where we resolve it. So I hope that answers the question, and <laughs> Kemp wants to talk. <laughs> Um, the only thing I want to just negotiate directly with Kevin right here, <laughs> the, the uh, all-payer database, good, good goal, um, but it takes a lot to develop it. In Colorado, they've been at it for 10 years and they're still not there. So I wouldn't object to it ultimately, but in the moment, the only thing we have is fair health. So I would figure out how to use that. I would do some tweaks so people can't just uh, game the system, but I would still use that at the moment. Well, Kemp, that, that brings up a good point, that we should do the all-payer database before we do Dick's marijuana bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Esselman Gottfried, would you like the last word? <laughs> it's not, as I said earlier, it's not a question of one or the other. We can do both right away. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Okay. Folks, I really enjoyed listening to all three of you experts. I really, and thank you very much for your graciousness, openness, and candor. Really. So on behalf of the Medical Society, thank you indeed.